Father God, chapter 15 is a very important chapter because we get some insight into the heart of God. And so, Lord, I pray that your word would come alive to us tonight. Lord, we are watching again the things in this world. We have wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places, and they are increasing. And you told us all these things would come. And so, Lord, I thank you that we have at least the comfort in knowing that we're on a divine timetable. You have your plan. And Lord, we pray our hearts might be stirred to be bold in these days when so many in the world wonder what's going on. What an amazing open door to explain these things you foretold thousands of years ago. And so be with us now. Strengthen our faith. And thank you, Lord, that you love to be among your people. And thank you, Lord, it's by your grace that you're here because no one is worthy. And so we ask that you would be with us and you would fill this place with your presence, the sense of your Holy Spirit, and your word would come alive to each one in the room. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we had the battle. Jonathan and his armor bearer, we had that oath. Nobody should eat of anything till Saul was avenged of his enemies. And we saw how that went. The people flew upon the spoil because they were famished. And so then Saul told them, knock it off, stop eating the blood. And they rolled out a stone and they began to cut things up and properly bleed the blood out. And then they were going to continue to attack the Philistines. But the priest said, you know, maybe we ought to just, you know, check in with God. And in so doing, the Lord refused to answer. And so Saul said, okay. Who messed up? All you guys be on one side. Jonathan and I will be on the other side. The people said, fine. And so they ended up casting the lot, and Saul and Jonathan were taken. They cast the lot again. Jonathan was taken. He said, what have you done? They said, I I took a snack. Now I got to die? Saul said, you will surely die, Jonathan, and more so. And the people said, whoa, 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 hold on. And so they rescued Jonathan, that he died not. And Saul went up from following the Philistines, and everybody went home, and it was uh, kind of embarrassing. So now chapter 15. Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people. God sent me to anoint you over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Now how'd it go last time? Wait there until I show up on the seventh day. How'd it go? Did he listen? No. Now, do you feel some compassion for the guy? They've got all these enemy soldiers out there. He's only got so many following him. The people are getting nervous. They're kind of peeling off left and right and going to hive in caves and pits. And so there's some empathy there for Saul that that had to be stressful. Didn't you go home like that? I would have been upset too. But he failed to wait. So now he's getting another test. The Lord sent me to anoint you to be king over his people, over Israel. Now, therefore, you know, please, Saul, hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he lay wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Put your finger in your text, turn to Exodus 17, left turn. Let's review that. They have come out through ten plagues. They have come out through the Passover, the blood of the Lamb. Death has passed over. God has delivered them. They've gone through the Red Sea. God begins to feed them with manna. In chapter 17, congregation began to travel. In verse 8, then came Amalek, the Amalekites, and they fought with Israel and Rephidim. Moses said unto Joshua, Choose you out men and go and fight with Amalek tomorrow, and I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. And so Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Moses' hands were heavy. You go out and try it and hold them up all day. So they took a stone and they put them under him. 
And there he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, one on one side, the other on the other side, and his hands were steady till the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people. All right, first thing we have to do. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, because they had attacked them and come upon the rear of the guard and wiped out those in the camp. So remember this, that I will have a contest with them until they are wiped out. So back to our chapter. Thus saith the Lord, remember that which Amalek did to Israel. It was also mentioned by Balaam that they would come to their end. How he laid for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. And they had attacked them. So now God will bring that final judgment. Do you know how much later it is? Almost 500 years. I'd say God gave him a little time to straighten up. What do you think? 500 years. How old's our country? He gave him 500 years. It's time. It's time for the judgment of God to come upon them. So now go. By the way, utterly destroy all. So what benefit is there to Saul and his people? What's the answer? Zero. This isn't about money. This isn't about, you know, uh, gain, so to speak. It is about God bringing a corrective rod of judgment against a wicked people who attacked his people as they came out of Egypt, have continued in their wickedness, and so now God finally brings that rod of correction. And by the way, When Israel turns further and further into idolatry and further and further into rebellion against God from everything from worshiping in the high places to I was reading to the biddies the other night and there we just had the two older ones because we dealt with a thousand wives and all that. And they're going thousand wives and you know, and uh, and we started talking about how they led him away to where he'd worship Chemosh and Molech. And that that involves Molech's human sacrifice, southern area of Jerusalem, the Valley of Hinnon, there on the Hill of Shame, down directly south from the temple there these things would begin to be poured out and Israel would turn. And when that happened, God would send to the northern kingdom the Assyrians who would judge them and wipe them out with a rod of correction and deport them. And to the southern kingdom, he sent the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar to wipe them out and to deport them. So God is dealing with the Gentile nations and Israel is his rod of correction. When Israel gets caught up in the same Gentile practices, then God uses other nations to correct them. And when you think about it, some say, well, hey, hey, listen to what he does. Go destroy all. Look at verse 3. Destroy elderly all that they have. Spare them not. Slay both man, woman, infant, suckling, ox, sheep, camel, and donkey. Everything goes. It's all under the ban. Wow. And you Christians are going to sit here and tell me he's a God of love. How long has he been waiting? 500 years. What's coming to this earth? A judgment. Against whom? Everyone. All who are here. You know, it always gets interesting. We're, we're looking at carpet. <laughs> when you tear it all up, you have to replace it, right? And um, the, so the person who was here was explaining things. And this part's environmentally friendly. And this is green. And I said, it's all going to burn. And she's like, well, why is it it's fervent heat? The elements are going to let loose. And you can see it's, it's not part of the sales pitch. We don't care. It's all going to burn. Not that we don't, you know, we put recycled stuff in the recycle bin, but we don't really care. It's all going to burn. And she was like. <laughs> so that's nice, but that's, that's not high on our list, you know. And it just, the green initiatives are going to be fervent heat. So. There's a judgment of God coming. Do you have to face it? Do you have to bear that wrath? Can everybody collectively agree the answer is no? No, you don't have to bear it. How do you escape? Just as there was one way to escape the flood through the ark with Noah, there's one way to escape the wrath of God that's coming through Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He said, I'm the resurrection and the life. If a man believes on me, though he dies, yet he'll ever live. We have eternal life through Jesus Christ. Not only life and to come, but we also have the forgiveness of sins in this life, the removal of guilt, shame, and all that else that comes with it. So we have a a renewed life here while on this earth, and we have eternal life waiting for us to step into heaven. 
And the wrath and the judgment that we deserve was handled on the cross. He said, it is finished. Literally paid in full. What they stamp on a document when someone would pay off a debt to tell us that. Paid in full. Not, now it's your turn. Paid in full. And so as we see this judgment of God against the Amalekites, a wicked people, God does judge sin. You know, the, the liberal critics in the word, and this was within the church, well, that's a terrible thing. Hello, he's holy, he judges sin, and he's going to judge everyone. Jesus said, each of us will give an account before God. Every idle word, he said, will give an account before God. So if you know God's going to judge sin, and you know you're a sinner, wouldn't it be wise to accept the payment that he's made on our behalf that we might be forgiven our sins and receive eternal life? Yes. And yet so many refuse. We've been in the book of Acts on Tuesday morning tune-up. Now we're in 1 Thessalonians. We're going through some things about the judgment of God that's coming up and, and all. But there you look at Paul. Paul was preaching in Thessalonica. Paul the apostle is preaching. Some believed. And guess what? Some didn't. Could you get better preaching? Peter, Dave Pentecost. Some believed. What happened? Some didn't. How about the Lord himself? Some believed, many didn't. And so when we see this judgment of God, some people go, well, you know, this, this, this is horrible. You have to step back and say, wait a minute, there's a holy God. If they had repented, we know he spares those who repent because Rahab's in the crew and others. Rahab came from Jericho. Jericho was a city like the Amalekites under the ban. And yet she repented. She and her household, they were delivered out. But a holy God must judge sin to remain consistent with himself. And so he can either let it be judged upon his son, you receive that payment by faith, or if you reject that, then you stand before a holy God. As it said, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God because he must judge our sin. But how can you call that a God of love? Simple. He loved you so much he came down and he took your place, lived a sinless life, then bore your sin and the wrath it was due, and then rose again. And now extends to you freely forgiveness, grace, mercy, and fellowship with God if you would open your heart and repent. And so, yes, he has to judge sin. He must. And this idea among the church that, well, you know, who knows if there's really a literal hell and there's a literal judgment, it, he must to be consistent with himself. But he's made the way for us to be redeemed. Go smite them. It's time for judgment. Destroy utterly all that they have. There is no gain in this campaign for them. It is simply to bring God's corrective judgment against this Canaanite group that has come up against his judgment. So Saul gathered the people together. Okay, what's his job? Let's repeat here. Wipe out the Amalekites. Why? Corrective and chastening rod of God and judgment against them. Okay, what are they allowed to take home? Nothing, okay? You know, with the biddies, we were going through the king should not multiply wives or gold and silver. And then we're reading through Solomon, and they're kind of going, this is the guy with wisdom, right? <laughs> so Saul gathered the people together, verse 4, numbered them, Telaim, 200,000 footmen, 10,000 men of Judah, interesting, called Place of the Lambs, and Saul came to a city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. And Saul said unto the Canaanites, Go, depart, get you down from among the Malachites. This is the family line of the kindred of Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, helped guide them through the wilderness wanderings there as they went through Midian and came around into Canaan. And so they had helped them. Moses had asked them to come with them. Depart and get away from them, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And small smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur, that is over against Egypt, working across the country there. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. What's wrong with that? How many see that's a violation of the instructions? How many have heard of Haman? How many know what book he's in? What's the book? Esther. 
Haman, we're told in chapter 3, verse 1, is an Agathite. Most feel perhaps descended from the line of Agag, which would make him a Malachite. Did he cause a little trouble to Israel? If you've read the book of Esther, you know, and if not, now you have homework. They took him alive. And they utterly destroyed all the people at the edge of the sword. Wait a second. Wasn't it just last week that he was willing to kill Jonathan for having a, the trail mix? Because he violated Saul's oath? And here God's told him clearly, explicitly, nobody leaves that town and he spares the king? How many see the snapshot? So he was willing to sacrifice his own son, who's, who's an incredible person. Can't wait to meet him one day in heaven. And he spares a wicked king that he was told to put under the ban. And that's what happens when we begin to be more concerned with what we want than what God wants. We begin to act in ways that, to the outside person, make no sense. So when you see someone begin to backslide or get into nonsense, it, it's sad because then you, you begin to watch it corrupt other areas of their thinking. And the sad part is the person who's compromising or backsliding in their witness, often they don't even see it themselves. They're just, they put their mind or their, their attention in the wrong places and it begins to just, it just begins to infect their, their processes and the people around them start, he's not thinking clearly. And then sadly over time it comes out and then you find out, yeah, and they weren't behaving clearly either. It's funny how sin gets in and just begins to blind you and blind you and blind you to where the people around you can see your blindness and you can't see it yourself. It happens so quickly, so subtly. He spared Agag. Last week, he was willing to take Jonathan out. But they utterly destroyed all the people at the edge of the sword. And Saul and the people spared Agag, verse 9, and the best of the sheep and of the oxen. What's wrong with that? They were to spare nothing. And you know, they spared the best. They got rid of all the sick and the weak and the lame oxen and lambs. And what's the point? But, and the lambs of all that was good. And would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse, that they utterly destroyed. Well, yeah, that's easy. All the reject stuff, that's, you know, who'd want to keep it anyway? Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me. All right, first thing we have to deal with. Does God have sin? How many are not sure? God has no sin, he's holy. How many... In him there is no shadow or turning or darkness. Jesus confronting his opponents in John 8 said, Which of you convinces me of sin? God is holy. He has no evil, not even a hint. He is a, a, a part, sinless. So how can he repent? Well, that's why you're here. We thought you'd tell us. <laughs> For men and women to repent, the idea is to turn from our ungodliness and to basically pull a 180 and begin to turn and to embrace the things of God. The idea of metanoia often in the Greek, to change one's mind, to go from one direction that's the wrong way, to turn and go toward the right way. And there's a, you know, if you ever listen to Toby Mack, one time he was sharing the gospel at a concert, and he talks about, you know, if you've gotten so far from the Lord, you've wandered so far away, and you say, you know, I, I can't go back through all that to get back to him. You know, I, I've messed up so far. I'm so far from God. And Toby Mack said, just turn around and he'll be there. You he strayed all this way, but he was following. Just turn around. He'll be there to embrace you and bring you back. So for a person, repentance is to go from an ungodly direction to a godly direction. But the term repentance here is really the best that can be given to us to help explain what God is doing. Saul has changed from that humble man looking for donkeys who was first anointed as king, who was just humble. He was hiding among the stuff. It wasn't the best idea, but this, this idea of he's, he's self-depreciating. He's, he's kind of in the back. He comes in from plowing. He's the last one in from the herd and the animal and, and the dust and all that and just seemed to be a generally humble man. But he begins to really slide off the rails here to where he's more concerned about Saul and being venged of his enemies and Saul's word being honored when he has that oath put on the people and now here taking things even though God told him not to. And so Saul has really begun to become more about Saul and less about God. And so now God begins to change how he is dealing with Saul. God is immutable. That's a big word for the unchangeable ness, 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 ness. And I had the nisses because he doesn't change. I'm glad he doesn't change. I'm glad he doesn't say one day, cherubim, you know what? I don't want to save anybody. 
That would be a problem, wouldn't it? He doesn't change. But his dealings with Saul now must change because Saul has departed from being obedient. And so, coining this best we can to say, in a sense, not that God is repenting in character and conduct, but now God must change his dealings with this unfaithful king. It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. Now, God knew, but now he must change what is going on with Saul. And we'll see how in this chapter and next one. For he has turned back from following me. How do you know? What's the sign? Ready for this? He's not obeying God's word. Ever been there? You know what the word clearly says about something? But something out there, the best of it, looks so good that you kind of put this aside so you can indulge a little there. And how does it go for you? Did it satisfy? Did it fill your heart? Did it bring you joy, unspeakable? Did it give you a sense of peace in his presence? Or did you find yourself going and then having to go back? He's turned back from following me, from obeying what God has instructed him to do. And he hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, there's a snapshot of that man's heart. He was hoping and rooting for Saul. Even though he didn't like the idea of them asking for a king, having anointed him, Samuel was there. He was, he was, he was very much a supporter, and now he's grieved that God is pulling back. And look at this. Samuel cried unto the Lord all night. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, not, not, not Mount Carmel, but really near the area south of Hebron, Carmel, David will be there in the future to meet Abigail. We'll get into that. Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place, a yad. What's a yad? Often called a place or a hand. We're going to have a meeting tonight about Israel, but if you've been with us to Israel, you have been to Yad Vashem. What is Yad Vashem? It's the Holocaust Museum, and it's called a place or a hand, and Vashem, a name. And that's where they remember the Holocaust. So he set up a Yad. That word is still being used by Israel today for Yad Vashem. Set up a place or a hand. He set up a monument to his victory. Go team. What does he really set a monument up to? What else? His disobedience. He set up a monument. An arch, whatever he did, something. Saul's busy. He's making a monument to his great victory. He's gone about. Oh, what do you know? He just passed on. Now he's gone down to Gilgal. Can't catch up with him. So, Samuel, verse 13, came to Saul. And Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Wait a minute. Look at verse 11. It repenteth me for having set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. God speaks that directly to Samuel. That's the real deal. Fast forward to verse 13. I've performed the commandment of the Lord. Anybody see a little disparity here? What's God's opinion? What's Saul's opinion? Denial. Who knows the truth? God and Samuel. You know, like, wow, wouldn't that be cool, to, you know, prophetic gift? Wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't that, I mean, wouldn't that be like, you know, in the moment, you could say, hey, God was saying, and they're like, well, how'd you know that? It's cool until you know things like this. When someone right in front of you is lying to your face, and they think you don't get it, and yet the Lord has revealed to you that they're completely lying in your face. I've performed everything the Lord said. Verse 14, Samuel said, oh yeah, I added that. What meaneth then the bleeding of the sheep? That's great. Why are all these sheep here bleeding in mine ears? They're supposed to be wiped out. And why do we hear the lowing of oxen, which I hear? And Saul said, they. They've brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen. 
to sacrifice unto the Lord. What does it say? Thy God. Don't miss that. There'll be three thighs in this section. Thy God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. Wait a minute. Who's he trying to blame? It's those people. I mean, they just were having such a fun time wiping out the Amalekites. They decided to hang on to the livestock. I mean, how could I stop them? Wait a second. Let's review. Last week he said, nobody eats. Did anybody eat? No, nobody ate except for Jonathan, who didn't hear the command or the oath. So did Saul have complete control over the people the week before? Yep. So he let them do it. And yet he blamed them. But the rest we've utterly destroyed. Then said Samuel unto Saul, stay, let me translate, cease silence. By the way, let me characterize this exchange. Samuel is hot. He was used by the Lord to anoint Saul, brought him up, helped him, supported him, encouraged him. And this guy, Samuel has served the Lord his entire life. He started with Eli and his wicked sons who were messing around with the women who came to the tabernacle and stealing from the sacrifices and all the nonsense they're doing. And you know what? Samuel remained faithful. He remained faithful through all that and everything that he's done in his ministry. He last week said, okay, anybody's got a complaint, you think I stole from you, bring it before the Lord's anointed and make your... Nobody could charge him. Samuel has run the course, has run the race, and has remained faithful. Saul's only been at it for a little while, and he refuses to take responsibility for any of his disobedience. Samuel, stop. Silence. And I will tell you what the Lord has said unto me this night. And Saul can't even shut up for a second. Say on, like he's giving him permission. Samuel said, when thou wast little in thine own sight, oh, do you remember when you were just a guy who wanted to serve God? What happened to that man or that woman who just wanted to serve God? Was just happy to carry a bucket of cold water in Jesus' name. Remember when thou wast little in thine own sight? Wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? God's the one who raised you up. You had nothing to do with it. You were looking for donkeys. And the Lord anointed the king over Israel. And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. He gave you a simple job here. I mean, Joshua did it. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord? But didst fly upon the spoil and didst evil in the sight of the Lord. Why did you not listen? And Saul said to Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the word of the Lord. Denial, full denial. Oh, yes, I have obeyed. We're not reaching him. And have gone the way which the Lord sent me. And I've brought Agag, the king of the Amalekites, and utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil, sheep, oxen, chief things, which should have been utterly destroyed. He knew better, and he still didn't listen. They brought it to sacrifice unto the Lord thy, verse 21, God, here it is twice, in Gilgal. And here comes the punch. Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Do you know that simple obedience is more of a blessing to God than great religious show? And yet we can make such show of things. To obey is better than sacrifice. In fact, if you think about it, sacrifice is when you, we're going to go worship. We're going to bring our sacrifice and we're going to burn it. We'll eat part of our take, whatever, if it's a burnt offering or you know, peace offering. Or, we're we're going we're gonna to sacrifice. It's part of worship. But obedience is a form of worship, isn't it? Obedience is when you are submitting yourself to God's will and walking in obedience. In other words, you are worshiping God by saying, you are Lord of all, even my behavior or my thought life or my whatever the case may be. It's, it's an act of, of submission. Bowing down in a sense. To obey is better than sacrifice. To hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion, which is what we got here, is a sin, or is as the sin of witchcraft, or the idea of divination. It's, it's as though you're worshiping another god. And in this case, the rebellion is the worship of self. 
self-will over God's will. Rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. It's a form of apostasy. You're not in obedience to the Lord. Stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Again, self-will. It's like an idol. Do you remember when James said, do you believe in God? You do well. But even the demons believe and tremble. The demons are not atheists. They believe there is a God, but what are they missing? They don't obey him. If we really fear God and we really believe that he is, and we've learned again this evening that there's going to be a judgment one day that will come to this entire world, and if we want to be spared that judgment, then we need to place our faith in the risen Christ, who is the way, the truth, the life, the only man, the only God-man, the one mediator between God and man who can redeem us to God, then we should pay heed and, and walk in obedience to it. Today, if you hear the Lord's voice, don't harden your heart. Open it. Rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. Stubbornness is like iniquity and idolatry because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. He has also rejected you. And by the way, those who reject Jesus, he will also reject them. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. You're done. And Saul said unto Samuel, now that it begins to sink in, I, I've sinned, for I've transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people. Yes, he did. By the way, King Saul, if you fear the people, then you're really not a leader, and you're not fit to lead. I feared the people, and I obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, I pray thee, pardon my sin, and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord. Boy, that had to be hard for us. Like, really? And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. Wow. And the Lord has rejected thee from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned about to go away, Saul laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle, desperately grabbing at it, and it rent. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and has given it to a neighbor of thine who is better than you. Ouch! Wow! Oof! And also the strength of Israel, title only used here, will not lie nor repent. He is unchanging. For he is not a man that he should repent. In other words, it's over. Saul, realizing now that he's really in trouble, he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now, I pray thee, before the elders of my people. What's he worried about? Image. He's worried about image. So turn again with me that I may worship the Lord thy God. And by the way, here it is, third time, thy God. Samuel turned again after Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. Samuel really, I think in many ways, keeping it from becoming a civil war and a power struggle, went before the people with him. Then said Samuel, bring ye hither to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came unto him delicately. The idea is, you know, just not sure what's going to happen. And Agag said, surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, As thy sword hast made women childless, so shall thy mother be childless among women. And Samuel, hey, remember when he said, Behold, you're old? Remember that was like three chapters ago? You're old, we need a king. Well, we're many chapters later, so he's now really old. The really old Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Wow. He finished what Saul failed to finish. Brought him under the ban of God. And that had to be a moment. And Samuel went up from Ramah, and Saul went up to his house to Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. It was over. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned. Here's a snapshot. He mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. And now changing that direction. And the Lord said unto Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil, they'd use horns as vessels, and go. And I will send thee to Jesse, who's the grandson of Boaz and Ruth. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. 
And Samuel said, well, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he'll kill me. Apparently Saul is deteriorating even further. And the Lord said, take a heifer with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Whoa, God just gave him a cover story. Now, is Samuel going to do something that's ungodly? No. Is he going to do something that is you know, wrong before God? No. He's going to do a good thing for a plan of God. So God allows him to conceal it. God allows him secrecy. Concealment of a good purpose for a good purpose, God allows. And so take an heifer with you, say you've come to sacrifice, and then anoint him. And so call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto you. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and he came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming. After all, what's the last thing they've heard of? Man, when he gets upset, he just cuts people down. <laughs> he may look old, but he's mean. They trembled and said, hey, uh, you come peaceably? Anybody in trouble in this town that we need to be aware of? And he said, shalom, peaceably. Am I come to sacrifice unto the Lord? So sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons. And he called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab, God his father, and he said, surely the Lord's anointed is before me or before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Please learn this lesson. Look not on his countenance, its outward appearance, nor on his height. Oh, thank you. <laughs> nor on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. The Lord seeth not as a man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. How long will it take us to learn this? This world is so enamored with judging with the eyes. Is it cool? Is it happening? Is your car happening? Is your house happening? Are your clothes happening? Is your job happening? Is your due happening? Are you happening? Right? And it's all like right away, visually, they sign you up, you know, just size you up and okay. And they go right with the outward. How many people have you met that look like they're happening on the outward? Then you get to know the inward and you go, wow, this guy's a mess. Been there? Done that? Don't look on the outward appearance. Find out about the heart. Proverbs says it this way. Charm is, beauty is, but a woman who fears the Lord is or shall be praised. Proverbs 31. The world's so focused on the outward. I don't look on the outward, Saul, Samuel. I look on the heart, not him. So then Jesse called Abinadab, father of the source of liberality, the idea. He made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse called Shammah, fame or renown, to pass by. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this. And again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, well, there remaineth yet the youngest. We didn't even bother to call him. Behold, he keeps the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, get him. Send and fetch for him. For we will not sit down until he come hither. Wow, you know, it's not easy being the youngest. How many have been the youngest? Okay, you know, and you're always like the last. I have a heart for Andrew because he's always, you know, everybody runs outside, boom, the door slams, boom, he hits it, falls down. And then he's like, you know, trying to get the latch and all that. Just I feel for the brother. You know, it's just the way it goes. He's learned to get doors on his own now, but he, they don't even call him to come in. Some say Josephus says age 10. Others say no, perhaps 15 to the early, like almost just 20. But he's a young man. And they don't even bother to call him. Well, fetch him. We're not going to sit down until he comes. And so he sent and he brought him in. Now he was ruddy. The idea is Auburn, perhaps, or a little reddish, maybe from running or whatever the case may be. Some say hair, and who knows? We'll find out in heaven. And with all of a beautiful countenance, literally beautiful eyes or fair eyes that are brilliant or bright. They are the window of the soul. 
and goodly to look upon. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. You know, all the older brothers are like, what? What? I, no. Anoint him, this is he. Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. The question comes up, did they really understand what was going on here? Some say that they felt perhaps he was being called into the school of prophets that Samuel would start. Others say, no, they, they got it, and we'll see it as he goes to the cave of Adullam there, and he's rejected and fleeing from Saul, and they'll eventually begin to gather to him. But we'll unfold that as we go. Right now, here comes Samuel, the kingmaker, who shows up, rejects all seven, goes to the eight, seven number of completion, interesting, eight number of new beginning, takes him, anoints him, the youngest of the pack, and the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up, and he went to Ramah. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Why? Because he's been rejected. And an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. God allowed it. Okay, first question, can that happen to you as a believer? Uh, well, uh, mm, uh. When we receive Jesus, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, he tells us he seals us with the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 1 also tells us we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 tells us we've been sealed by the Holy Spirit to the day of redemption, therefore we ought not to grieve him. John's gospel, chapter 14, tells us he will give us another comforter. He will be with us, he will be in us, and the Spirit of God will be with us forever. 1 John 4, 4 tells us greater is he who is in us, which we receive by faith in Christ, than he who is in the world. So we have been sealed. Now, to counterbalance that, we've been sealed, but we have an enemy who is like a roaring lion, seeking to devour whom he may. We were told that Peter there on the night Jesus was betrayed, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you. When you return to me, strengthen your brethren. Ephesians 6, we need the shield of faith because there's the fiery darts of the enemy. So we can be attacked, we can be sifted, and we can be pursued like a roaring lion. He can knock, but he can't come in. He can make things miserable all around us, but he can't have us. And God promised us the Holy Spirit forever, which is why we have the new covenant, the better covenant, which was mentioned in Jeremiah 31. There would be a new covenant where God would change our hearts of stone to hearts of flesh and write his ordinances upon them. That was through the Holy Spirit. But in the old covenant, Saul, in walking in disobedience, the anointing of God comes off of his life and now an evil spirit is allowed. And remember, Satan's always looking for bait. Now an evil spirit is allowed to do what they've longed for the entire time, torment what is the Lord's anointed. And so it's allowed to come. An evil spirit began to trouble him. I prefer the new covenant. How many else? Okay, good. I'm not alone. At least three of you out there. Saul's servant said unto him, Behold now, hey, an evil spirit of God troubleth thee. And Saul said, Really? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Come on, just kidding. I lighten up. It's got to be bad when they all go, wow, something funky is going on there with Saul. Hey, we think you got an evil spirit there, man. Uh, Let our Lord now command thy servants, verse 16, which are before you, to seek out a man. We, we need help. We need a cunning player on a harp. And it shall come to pass when the evil spirit of God is upon thee that he shall play with his hands and you shall be well. By the way, a great way to get rid of oppression, depression from the enemy or whatever is put on praise music and start worshiping. You want to get rid of like, you know, the, the oppressive blues of the enemy, start praising. You don't even need a, an MP3 player, radio boom box, whatever you use, real to real tape. You can just start singing. But you start praising and everything starts changing. So we want to get you someone who can play so you'll be well. So Saul said to his servants, okay, provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. Then answered one of his servants, the Jews in their tradition say Doeg, who we'll bump into again later when the priests are killed, but we'll just put that out there. One of the servants answered and said, behold, I've seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is a cunning man, a mighty man, which is why we leaned a little older there in the age scale, valiant man, a man of war, prudent in matters, a comely person. And by the way, all those attributes are important to Saul, which is why they mention them. Comely person, and the Lord is with him. Wherefore, Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. Boy, wait a minute. First Saul show, or Samuel shows up, 
anoints him, and now Saul wants him. You know, his brothers are like, what gives? He's just a punk. So Jesse took a donkey laden with bread and a bottle of wine and a kid and sent them by David, his son, unto Saul. And David came to Saul and stood before him, and he beloved him. He loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer, part of his entourage, his support. And Saul said to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. This gets interesting. And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David, let's not forget this, David, anointed with the Holy Spirit, began to play through the power of the Holy Spirit. And as the presence of the Spirit in David's life is there, it is driving out the demonic activity in Saul's life who is in front of him. In other words, the presence of the Spirit in our lives among this lost world can also be used to challenge the darkness. That's why when Paul said, who is sufficient for these things? There's a whole realm going on around us that we don't see, and it's God's grace we don't, or we'd, we'd flip out. But we have the witness of the Spirit in us. He gives his angels charge over us, Psalm 91, in all our ways, which is in context. We have the realm of heaven on our side. Which is why sometimes you enter into a place and the people who don't know the Lord are quite antagonistic to you. It's a light versus darkness thing that you're, you're, you don't even know what's going on. But interesting, the evil spirit would leave as David, anointed by the Holy Spirit, would take a harp, begin to play under that anointing, and Saul was refreshed and well, and the evil spirit departed from him. I wonder where this is going to go. We'll have to pick it up next week. Let's stand. Let's pray. Lord, how we thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit to those who believe. And Lord, we see a world ripe for judgment. They have laughed in your face about your word, your commandments, your statutes, what is right, what is wrong. And Lord, it seems as though it becomes more and more popular and electable to become more and more anti-God. It seems that's where we're headed. And Lord, it sadly seems at all levels of government, there are no rules. People seem to be able to do whatever they want for whatever purpose they express. And our whole system was founded on the fact that there is a final authority. The God of the Bible. There are things that are right and there are things that are wrong and God will judge. And government was to restrain evil, not promote it. Lord, how we pray that we would be salt and light in this generation. We would not be afraid to stand for your truth. And Father, we pray you would so fill our hearts that, Lord, we can't help but tell people about our Savior. And Father, lastly, I pray for anyone here this evening that doesn't know you. God is going to bring us all before himself. If you accept Jesus before men as your Savior, he'll pronounce and accept you before his Father. But if you reject him here while on this earth, he will say, depart from you, work of iniquity. I never knew you. And he will reject you before his father. Today, if you hear the Lord's voice, don't leave this place without opening your heart to him. Right where you stand and ask him to be your Lord and your Savior. If you'll confess him as your Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And the Lord will change you with his spirit from the inside out. Thank you for these things, Lord. And help us to see people from the heart and not from the outward appearance that we might be more like you. In Jesus' name, amen.